Lake Brewery in Fort Worth, Texas. It's time for You Can't Brew That on Television. Now here are your hosts, Brewmeisters Kyle. Oh, wait. Brewmeisters the Reverend Ryan Bilo and Kyle Invictus LaPointe. There we go. There it is. Good evening, Internet, and welcome to yet another exciting episode of You Can't Brew That on Television. We are your hosts. I am the Reverend Ryan Bono. And I am Kyle Invictus Droid LaPointe. Invictus Droid LaPointe. And we are here, as we are every Monday, live to help you bridge the gap between Beer Snob and Frat Boy. We've got a jam-packed show. What do we got tonight, Kyle? We're going to talk about the Blue Bonnet. We're going to talk about... Out uh, brewing this last weekend in our 10-hour brew yeah, session. Yeah, we had a 10-hour brew session. It was, it, was, it was quite the adventure, and we'll try not to get too involved in that because it can get really boring early. I was trying to tell my wife that story. and It, it just took got, nine and a half hours. Yeah, it got, so it got, it got really got repetitive. But uh, we've got some trivia. Got trivia. We're going to what, – what, what are our topics tonight? We're also going to talk about uh, the you know blow-off tube uh, fermentation okay. instead of an airlock yeah, for when you have – uh, something like what we've got tonight, which is uh, the ten-hour brew producing a barley wine that was crazy, blowing off, still blowing off. But uh, then we also have uh, we have a sign-off. Okay. Yeah, we have, we have a sign-off. We're gonna sign off, and then we have a very special treat for you, everyone. The Bible says to judge not, lest you be judged yourselves. Kyle and I have done a lot of judging, and tonight we will be judged. We're going to have a panel of judges to judge beers tonight live for you after the show. For the and Cap and Hair Homebrew Clubs for Master Brewer Competition. That's right. And one of those beers was submitted by us. Yep. So we're completely ready to get slammed because we slam other people's beers. <laughs> and that's the way it goes. Yep. We don't pull any punches. And that's the way this kind of thing is. It's a, it's a good adventure for those who are, are trying to look at what judging processes are about. And they're trying to look at what, or maybe looking at their beer that got submitted, trying to figure out, okay, well, what do these people really think about it? Because even a even a veteran judge on a score sheet only has so much time and so much paper to write what they think. This way, you get to see for uh, what the beer is, what it tastes like, and what judges actually feel about it. Speaking of beer, where are we drinking tonight? Tonight we're drinking Maximum. Maximum. This is a Lithuanian ale that one of our studio audience members just informed us is a Hellesbach. A Doppelbach. Well, that's the closest thing. That's the closest guess. (laughs) Or a sugar bomb, as he has told us. Yeah, this beer apparently transcends style, and it's pouring kind of golden. I'm... Yeah, it, it looks golden. I, I believe you're. Sm- it smells here. very Europey. Hmm. <laughs> That's a new. Yeah, bro. yeah. Europey Europe is. It's in the BJ. Yeah, it could be really bad. Like, yeah, oh, it's <laughs> one of the. Uh, it's a it's a desirable trade in Europey beers. So what what are you getting this right off the top? Malt. Malt for sure. Malt. Huh? I'm not getting much else. And and again, it's very European. It's, it's the, those European malts that you're getting in there. It's not really very big. It's not really very big on flavor. Ooh, it's super sweet. Yeah, it's very sweet. That is super sweet. That is like um, wow. That tastes like they just only had about a fifty barrel fermenting tank, and so they reuse it every day. <laughs> It's it is Lithuania. Just yank it right so off the yeast and knows? send it into the bottle. I don't know how it's so clear. It's not that. It's clear. not very clear at all. That's actually one of the things I was going to point out. It's kind of cloudy. And your glass is frosted too. Yeah. Well, I was looking. <laughs> I was looking through the clear part, wise ass. <laughs> Let's talk about the blue bonnet. We got the blue bonnet coming up this last Saturday. While we were having our 10-hour brew session that we selfishly did while yeah. everybody else selflessly worked on checking in all the beers, they checked in the beers. And uh, we did this, or I did this last year. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the check-in is a big-time organizational, organized chaos, I guess is the best way to put it. There are so many people coming in there to help, people passing bottles everywhere. You end up with an assembly line. People are taking boxes, and they're opening them. That's all they do. Open a box. Hand the open box to somebody else. That person takes the beer out. Next person puts a wrapper on it. Next person does this, does that. And by the end of it, you've got beers that are getting categorized, labeled, tagged uh, to where they can be used in a double blind, uh, a double blind setup to where nobody knows what type of beer it is, just what style it is. They don't know who brewed it. They, you know, without looking up, going through the database, figuring out exactly what it is. 
It's a really good way to do it so that you know people can't go and judge their own beer. And, and as we've said in the past, this is the largest single-site homebrewing competition in the world. And naturally, that comes with its definite snafu potential. And they've managed to get it down to an art. Uh, I mean, it, it's very efficient the way they get it through there. Jay, you want to try this? I do. Yeah, go go ahead. Let, let's share. We do have a number of studio audience members tonight. Go, go ahead and give them that one, too. We, we do have a number of people in our studio audience tonight. They're going to be sharing this beer along with us. Yeah. And we'd also like to move on to some trivia that has been brought to us by our friends over at the half Fast Sportscast, which airs Wednesdays on the Lone Star at 8 Central. Yeah, that's 8 o'clock Central on Wednesdays here at FrontierTelevision.com, live as usual. And if you're a fan of the chat room, jump on in and talk to them about sports or uh, whatever. They're really open. So you guys have some trivia from these guys. Yeah, let's hear it. All right, the trivia tonight. Da, da, da. Why is it called Paps Blue Ribbon? I'm guessing it won a blue ribbon of some sort. Uh, I would, uh, if it's called, why is it called Paps Blue Ribbon? Because at one point, Paps actually owned the company. So what are we asking about, the Blue Ribbon or the Paps? I, I'm, I believe that they're probably asking about the Blue Ribbon. So I think the Paps, is, the Paps is much easier to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I say we go with the Paps answer. Well, Blue Ribbon sounds like something you would win at like a, like a farm, like a... Like a carnival or a fair type com- competition. So you I think, think it, was the, it was the fattest beer there? Yeah. yeah. Well, Blue Ribbons traditionally are, are the best, right? They're the number one at like a county fair or state fair <laughs> they, or whatever it may be. Just, or in a faster brewer competition, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say that just because at that time people actually cared about ribbons. Yeah. And I don't think that this beer ever won a Blue Ribbon for anything. So I'm gonna. So, go so you, th- you think it's, it's just a, a marketing ploy? It's a marketing ploy because that meant like the best. I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah, marketing ploy. Let's hear it. Well, apparently, before making beer, Mister Pabst owned a ribbon store and was known for this particularly sad ribbon that he eventually. No, not really. The answer <laughs> apparently is that at the 1893 did. Chicago World's Fair, oh. they won a best beer award. There's some contention about that. Okay, I should, I should have known that. I read a book about that World's Fair. I, Who hasn't? I mean, this guy apparently. <laughs> no, I, I actually did. But anyway, that was that was very. Actually, fun what's trip. funny about that is Johnny originally uh, submitted this trivia for you guys via cell phone, and he types like I do. So that was supposed to be the 1983 Chicago World's Fair, which I think we all remember. 1983. 1893 like it. Yeah, 18, yeah. Uh, no, 1893 is correct. World's Fair? When was the last World's Fair? Do they still have that? I don't know. I thought it was like in the let's, 70s. Let's, let's, or the, let's make that their trivia. Yeah. <laughs> when, the when was the last World's Fair? World's Fair. Uh, they're probably watching, so that's... Yeah, that's okay. They're too lazy to go look it up. <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> Before we get into the beer-related topics, I'd like to discuss a topic that <clears throat> is kind of near and dear to the hearts of, of a number of us here at the... Um, Lone Star, and that is the Fort Washita rebuilding. For those of you who may not know, Fort Washita is up just across the state line in Oklahoma, and I believe about six up seventy-five, months, right? Yeah, it's up up seventy-five a little bit, just north of Sherman. And about eight to ten months ago, it was burned to the ground by a couple of arsonists. And there is a big fundraiser coming up this Saturday in Durant, Oklahoma. Where they're in do yes, thank you very much. Durant, Oklahoma, and, and also at the f- Ford itself, there's going to be a gigantic reenactment weekend. They're going to have all kinds of military vehicles. They're going to have camps. They're going to have staged battles. They're going to have all just all kinds of stuff to try to raise money. Laser tag, you know rebuilding. things that are laser tag, like real, real manly stuff. Yeah, you know, authentic stuff. Sport stuff. Right. Pie they pie do pie. they do past reenactments and, and what was future that, uh, future reenactments. Peppermint schnapps or or s'more schnapps. Yeah, s'more flavored schnapps. schnapps. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's right. S'more sh- schnapps. <laughs> easy for you to say. Yeah, that is easy for you to say. So, what do we got next? Well, uh, we definitely have. Uh, well, wait, let's go a little more into the blue bonnet stuff. Okay. Let's talk about that before we go into what we were brewing. Because basically, what we brewed last weekend was an English barley wine. And we were brewing it for next year's blue bonnet, actually. Believe a it or year not. from now. So, we're, you know, we did this under the pretense we've been trying to brew this for a long time, but we knew it took 
a long time to brew that beer. Doing a decoction mash like we were planning on doing takes extra time. Extra long boil. You know, we were planning on brewing a small beer off of the mash that we had. So all those things take extra time. But uh, we had some issues. And so we'll get into that in a little bit. And a lot of issues. But Flu Bonnet <laughs> is the the biggest single site home brewing competition. We always mention that. We've talked about it many, many times on this show. This year, did we set a new record? Is that what I... 1,762. 1,762 <laughs> entries. Possibly 1,767. It's under contestion by our audience here. That, that is a lot of beer. Yeah. So, either, either way, yeah, 762 to 7 ish. And <laughs> that's, these are entries, and every person enters at least two beers, depending on the type of category. Yeah. So, usually it's three beers. Uh, if you want to go on and possibly win the best of show, you have to enter three beers. So that is a lot of beer. When you're talking about over 5,000 bottles of beer that everybody on Saturday processed and handled by hand, moved to the right categories, got into buckets, got into boxes, got ready to go for the judging, which will start taking place, what, in two weeks? Yeah, starts ju- next weekend? Starts next weekend because the, the festival this, itself is the weekend of the 25th. The judge yeah. two weeks. Yeah, so, so okay. those of you that are in the area, we really encourage you to come out and help judge. It, it's a really neat experience. Yes. I always say that you'll learn more in an hour or two of tasting bad beer and average beer than you will in a lifetime of tasting great beer. I'm learning a lot tonight. Yeah, uh, yeah me too. Uh, this has been a real great learning experience. <laughs> Um, do, do either of you guys want any more beer? Are you guys good? Mine's really cloudy. Oh, empty. <laughs> Yours is cloudy too? You also have a frosted bug? <laughs> to look through the clear parts. <laughs> Weisenheimer. So, the blue bonnet though, uh, in the judging process, is if you're around in the next two weekends when these judgings are taking place, we'll generally start, what, Saturday morning about 8 or 9 in the morning, Sunday morning about the same time. Some people show up and they'll judge a maximum of three sessions. Some people show up and they'll only show one, two. If you can get through three, you're a better man than I. I only do barley wine, so I I max out at two. (laughs) Yeah, and you can – it's great because the way they do the beers, if you don't know anything about beer, you probably don't want to judge. If you know some stuff about beer and you like beer a lot, even if you don't know all the nuts and bolts about styles and everything, they'll pair you with somebody or a couple of somebodies and let you get your feet running before – they uh, they pull off the training wheels and let you go. Absolutely, and it's a really neat experience because for those of you who are where, where I was a couple of years ago, and that is knowing what you're tasting but not knowing quite how to articulate it. Going to I this, thought you were going to say in diapers. Well, no, I mean I'm still. I'm still <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's I'm still, sore subject. Yeah, that's not very nice. We just hit a wet uh, spot on the road. <laughs> yes, we certainly did. <laughs> I, I digress. Um, it, it's really neat to go sit at the com- this competition and be paired with a couple of experienced judges and finally have explained to you what you're tasting so that you too can articulate because you know it's there, you just don't know what it's called. Mm-hmm. And so please don't be intimidated by this. If you are interested in beer at all and you're in the Fort Worth area, definitely come out and help. It's a lot of fun. It, yeah. yeah, and that we always, need, always the help. need the help. I mean, it's amazing how many beers we'll go through and then by the end of that first day you feel like, Man, we looked around, there were 70 people there. We're judging all day. Way to go. How many are left? Oh, about 80% of the beers that were just there. Yeah, you would, oh. you'd also be astonished at how hard it is to talk people into tasting free beer all day. Like I, I always I always think it'd be like there'd be hordes of people just out there trying to get free beer, but there's really nobody. Well, and when I was first getting into the brewing world uh, about three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, I was in the same boat. And I was looking at these judging things going, oh, no, 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 I don't know enough about yeah, judging. It's intimidating. I don't know enough about beers. It's very and, intimidating if you've I, never done it. Yeah, and I, I didn't know enough about those guidelines. There's no way you could have turned me loose on those style guidelines by myself, but you put me with a good judge, and I had a palate enough to where I could have helped. And that's really all that matters. You're not trying to set the world on fire and, and memorize all these styles and, and be the best judge in the world. You're just trying to add a diff, an additional palette and, and understand what you're tasting and talk about it. That's all you're trying to do. Yeah, so definitely come on out. Learn a lot about beer. Yeah, and contact us. And enjoy and, free beer. You know, webcast at dogwigbrewery.com will get you directions, information, whatever you need. Uh, check out our, our Facebook page. We'll post some more about it this week. Yeah, definitely. So we got yeah. You might want to touch on too the actual festival itself and what a lot of fun it is. Oh man, yeah, the, the, without a doubt. 
We've gushed about the festival in the past. This, <laughs> this, this, this is a really fun festival for those that haven't yes. pay, paid attention in the past. This is a really fun festival. They, they do a pub crawl. They do a room crawl. There's a lot of home brewers, a lot of homemade beer, and a lot of commercial beer as well. Commercial beers? The, the commercial brewers send yeah. their representatives out to hand out free bottles of beer on, on the commercial night. 172nd Amendment, what are those guys? that? Yeah, uh, 21st, yeah 21st, 21st Amendment Brewery. <laughs> that guy is amazing, and the stuff he brought last year was, you know, I can't believe he was giving that to people for free. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And, uh, and, and, there's, mm-hmm. and there's also a lot of people that come out and bring mead. So for those of you looking to try something new, maybe you've never had mead before. I, I know I hadn't really until last year's Blue Bonnet. Yep. Um, mead is definitely a change of pace, but if you have a taste for it, good. You, you, you might thoroughly enjoy it. Yep. I mean, if you, you like know. the sweeter sides of beers, yeah. like a maximum, right, then you're definitely in on some meads. I mean, no, this is really good for an under-attenuated beer. If this really is 7.5% alcohol, I'd hate to think what it could be if I put some more yeast on it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. It's just ready to go. It could be 10%. But, uh, all right, well. Moving right along, we did receive a couple questions from a viewer that we'd like to discuss. Okay. The answer is no, or five. 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 Uh, thank you. Uh, Thanks for asking. We're done. That's correct. So, are, are we... Are we going to read this? Is Rich going to read this? How does this work? You want me to talk about it? Yeah. Okay, so a friend of the show, Adam, he wrote in, I guess he's new to home brewing, and he's trying to get some feedback and some advice from people who have done it before. And uh, just correct me as I go here, Kyle, but he had he was making a – was it a Scotch Ale? Scotch Ale. Scotch correct. Ale at home, and he had bought – First beer, mind you. That's a, oh, this that's is, a tough this beer is to make first beer. Brew number one, yeah. Well, good on you. So it was uh, – He's he's bottled these and he says they're coming out. Some of them are coming out really sweet, and he, the carbonation is just not where he wants it to be. And yeah, he was saying that some of the bottles are flat, some of the bottles aren't. Um, did did he carbonate? Oh my god, that is awful! He used a bottling bucket. Uh, he used a bottling bucket. Okay. I'm fairly certain. Uh, I discussed him. You know, helped him through a lot of these processes. He was asking a bunch of questions, and you know the. Part of the problem, as I started asking him, was that he wondered what was going on about about the hops, too. He was already brewing the sweetest style out there. And I think it may have been a slight misconception in that that, that is the sweetest style, because I think he was... He Absolutely. Was, in fact, the BJCP guidelines for Scotch Ale describe it as somewhat dessert-like. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically uh, what you're getting when you brew a Scotch Ale. You're going to get just malt sweetness right up front. And it was because the Scottish people were too cheap to buy hops back in the day. Basically, that's yeah. That's pretty much where it came from. So these, uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of true. Yeah, it wasn't a joke. It was much <laughs> Do it again, just in case, for good measure. <laughs> hey, there we are. And if it was a joke, the butt of the joke, I think, is the country of Scotland. Oh, well, there it is. There it is. That's your home. That's your heritage. No, that is not my heritage. Move on with the more film. I'm not even going <laughs> to dignify myself with a response to that. <laughs> so we've got this uh this beer that's basically under uh, under uh under attenuated uh, yeah but I, I don't even know if that's the case because he also told oh i thought me, we were talking about this beer no, no, no this no. guy's beer is not necessarily under attenuated from, from what i was able to gather from him he didn't have some exact notes he didn't take hydrometer readings at the start for original gravity okay. but he took uh some notes on final gravity and I was able to ascertain that he was pretty close to where he needed to be. Little high for the, you know, for what he was aiming for. If the attenuation was was seventy percent, you know, or the sixty-five to seventy-five percent range, he was more at the sixty-eight. So he was on the lower side, but not all the way even at the bottom. So he had good attenuation from the yeast. The yeast was still active. I think he may have underpitched because I'm fairly certain it was a smack pack that he used for a larger beer. Oh yeah, it was at the that's bottom of the style. The gravities. Hurt. So I think what's gone on here, that in addition to the fact that he used uh, he used hops and was afraid that the hops were going to make more of an impact than they would. He okay. opened the hops packets. He had dumped them in his boil. He was doing a partial boil. So he, he felt like the smell of those hops was so fragrant that he was going to overdo the bitterness of the beer. And so he only ended up uh, boiling the boil hops for 45 minutes. And that's a huge difference. Yeah, that, that extra 15 yeah. minutes. And remember, That's 25% of the IBUs lost in that beer. Absolutely. And remember we talked about on the show in the past that the longer you boil your hops, the more bitterness you're going to get out of mm-hmm. them. And so that, that's a, a pretty serious – I would I would probably argue that there, there's probably more than 25% because I, it's probably like a parabolic curve. And a little bit, yeah. Yeah. And it, at least 25%. And I think that's the overall sweetness issue. 
uh, as far as the um, as far as the bottles being flat, sometimes when you're doing the bottling bucket, you mix everything in, and that's what he did. Uh, yeah, sometimes that's just some, the nature of the yeah, beast. Sometimes they're going to be. Yeah. You you can just rouse the bottle. Just take the bottle, give it a little shake, a little swirl, take it around, and then put it back and and let it keep going. And most likely that yeast will start doing some stuff, start carbonating. And we got some we, studio we have some audience participation. Studio audience, what's up? I had a problem with that where <clears throat> if you don't uh, mix your sugar up all the way. Mm-hmm. It'll settle in certain areas of the bottom of the bucket. Ah, okay. That's not getting any yeah, usually you're, yeah, it's stu- you got to stir it real good, and then about halfway through, stir it up again, and you make sure your sugar is up. Otherwise, you're getting like part of the sugar in one ball, part of no sugar. In the okay. And, and that that brings a good the, point. Matt was saying that they have sometimes. Uh, Matt and Brennan were talking about having stagnant areas in their beer, or the sugar settles to the bottom. That your bot- your priming sugar is settled to the bottom of the pr- of the bucket. And especially, Adam, if you bottled by yourself, which is very difficult to do quickly. Yeah, very difficult. And then that, that can easily be a problem. I used to have problems with that, too, when I first started brewing. And one of the things that I, this is my own fix for it, because I, I boil in a little more extra water just because I think that yeah. way. Yeah, and dissipate and get a little more absorption. Yeah, that, that, that makes so, sense. Yeah, so Brennan, use, use a little bit more. A lot of times people are going to bottle carbonate using sugar water. And one of our studio studio audience members suggested that if you boost the amount of water and keep the sugar the same, dilute it, dilute it a little bit more, you're going to get a more even mixture. And, and I'm I'm guessing that he might not have used sugar water; he might have just used sugar. And it's possible. And, and so, I, I so that, that sure. would that would definitely explain why you're getting a, a lot of sugar in some bottles and not so much in the others. And if you have if you have a mixture of that, you know that basically means there's not any priming sugar in some of those bottles. Yeah, well, absolutely. Thing he could have done too, and I've done this in the past too. Is if you boil it down too much when you're boiling your your priming sugar, you, you're you caramelizing it. Sugar, yeah, and then it definitely sinks. Yeah, that's and that's, that's, that's an, another excellent point. He might have boiled his car, his priming sugar too and long. And you're really not even supposed to boil it. No, you're not. I mean, you're supposed to take it to about 160, 170, enough to where you're steeping and killing any bacteria, and then you put it in your priming bucket. So the uh, going to 210 or getting even a slight boil, and you can caramelize some sugars. It probably won't caramelize much right off the bat if it's a small boil and a quick boil, but you will do it. You will add some sugars that won't ferment out. So, and a beer that's already sweet, you know, yeah. all these types of things could have added to it De- to snowball into an overly sweet beer. Yeah, definitely taking something that's already over the top and just pushing it that much further, I, I think, is what happened. But from the sounds of it, he made a sweet beer yeah. that, you know, it doesn't sound like there's any off flavors in there, you know, from what he's saying. And they said it, when he gets a bottle that's fully carbonated, it tastes pretty good and he likes it. So, you know, that's. All I can say is, you know, first SCS first first batches go. You've done a great job. Oh, we've, yeah. we've seen a lot worse first batches than that. So good job. <laughs> yes, like the applause. Very nice. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about our ten hour brew day, and uh, we only have about six or seven minutes to talk about our ten hour brew days. So we're going to have to try to make it brief. There was a lot of repetition. Yes, we can discuss three or four hours of our brew day in about thirty seconds. By saying that we decocted again and again and, and again, again and again and again. again. So we had about 12 decoctions by the yeah, end Yeah, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 decoctions. Uh, what a, I almost said what it boiled down to. That, that, Whoa! <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> right. What are problems? There it is. Where our problems began <laughs> were bad thermometers. And, and I think this is yeah, a, a really good problem. time to talk about making sure that you've got proper equipment when you're brewing. Because we had a thermometer that was giving us a low reading, and or I'm sorry, a high reading. High reading. And so we thought we would pour a bunch of cold water into our mash tun to kill to kill some of the temperature. And really, it was just fluctuating. Uh, we had been using a uh, an electric read, and I know that they go bad eventually. And we had seen some deviation in it. Uh, you know, like basically like a meat thermometer. So you, you run the cable in there. Most people have to uh, cover those, do something to get the water out of there because once the water starts getting in past the O-ring, then they're they're pretty much worthless. Well, it, it had gotten to that point. It was great before that, but it had gotten to that point now where that was not reading accurately. So we had one thermometer that was measuring, what, 7 to 10 degrees high, and we yep. had another thermometer that was measuring 7 to 10 degrees low. Right. So when we figured out that this thermometer was wrong, we put the other thermometer in, and we're like, whoa! We're now like, we're way low. Yeah, we're way low. So, <laughs> so we started doing multiple decoctions to try to bring our temperature up. Right. At one point, we thought we had 
gone too hot and killed all of our grains. So we just started randomly grinding grain into the mash tun. We we decided we weren't going to eliminate the ability for us to. Uh, we were not giving up on this barley. The, we Never say barley die. Wine. Way to go, guys. This we was were, going to happen. We could have made a 1060 or 1070 beer, but we weren't going to oh, yeah. cut it at that. We wanted yeah, we, a 1010. We wanted, we wanted barley wine. So we, we found a bunch more caramel, and we had a bunch more pale left, so we ground the crap out of about 8 or 10 more pounds of grain and, and basically restarted the mash. We were on the low end for what we needed. We only mashed about... Well, we hit it. We only, were on the, we only mashed about 19 or 20 pounds, which yeah. for what we were trying to do... We we easily could have mashed thirty, and we probably did by the end of the Pro- day. Probably. So we added a good, and we just kept decocting the whole time we were doing it. We we would take out another gallon, and and basically decocting is you take some of the mash and you boil it and put it back in, and it warms the whole tank. So we just kept doing that, kept doing that, kept doing. We probably did I, that 10, 15 times. I think we should have another episode on decoction mash because that, that's a really neat topic. It is fun, yeah. That well, let's talk about again sometime here in the next few months, but. After we got the mash done, everything was smooth sailing after the mash. The, the boil went beautifully. We, we, everything went fine. Three-hour boil. We hit within a few thousandths of our desired uh, gravity. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, we, we did it fairly well. And then we put it in the fermenter, as you are want to do. And we, we dropped it into our little fermenting refrigerator. And then Kyle wants to check it a little later. What, what, what did you find out there, Kyle? About two hours later, because we already put it on an elevated yeast cake. We yeah. had a yeast cake from a carboy that had made a, a bitter the weekend before. And so we took that, made the beer, and it was fermenting quite heavily within two hours. So we were getting a bubble. I, I, saw, I saw a bubble come out of there within 10 minutes of yeah. dropping in the and fermenter. I mean, that, that yeast was hungry. It Is was ready to go. pictures? Yes. Yes, definitely. So then we hit uh, and we, we went ahead and said, okay, well, I'll give it a few hours. And within about six hours, we went ahead and added a blow-off tube because by then, within six hours of the brew, it was already blowing out off through the, through the uh, airlock, which you can see the airlock on the top of that orange uh, blow-off uh, apparatus. And, and then the, and the blow-off tube itself is going off to the left of the picture of, of this particular picture. You can see the blow-off tube itself. And the purpose of this is to uh, allow that foam and that cross and somewhere to go other than blowing off your airlock. And you can see that airlock is already full because yeah, it already has. By the time by the time that airlock, uh, or by the time the the bubble off, and you can see all the CO two bubbling out of there through that hose. The CO two is going into a bucket of of sanitized liquid, and it's just blowing off carbonation. And that was blowing off. Uh, what, wait. You wrote this down. It was going blah 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 through a three eighths inch hose. It was going about a bubble off about seven times a second. It was going crazy within six hours. That's about what I was guessing too. I mean, it was really moving out of there. So, in most cases, oh, I'm sorry, we have a comment from Studio Audience. Were you ever a half a bubble off? No, we might have been. We might have been. He we, was a half a bubble to the left, and I was a half a bubble to the right. So which, we were which meant us a full bubble off. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, w- sometimes that's what you have to do with uh, when you get a very voracious, uh, ferocious, voracious. Maybe one of those words would have been better than both of them combined into one magic word. But uh, when you have something like that where the blow off I- is necessary. It's so easy to do. Just go ahead and attach that little hose and the little apparatus. I mean, you can get them anywhere at any home brew store for five bucks, ten bucks, whatever they may be. Worth every penny because otherwise you're just going to have that. You're going to have all the yeast just spurting out of the airlock. It creates a mess. If you don't, you know, just pay attention to it. Within the first two days, it's the only time it really matters. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and most, the overwhelming majority of the beers that you guys are going to make are not going to have this problem. No, because they're not going to cross in nearly as heavy heavily as an English barley wine will, and generally you're going to put say five gallons of wort into a carboy that's big enough to handle it and mm-hmm. and the crossing. Plus, most people underpitch their yeast anyway. A lot of people underpitch their yeast. Um, uh, Papazian in Papazian's book, he actually recommends the use of a blow off. He he seems to think it's the way to go because he says that there's a lot of bitterness. In that cross and in that foam sitting on top of your beer, but I have heard some controversy on this particular subject. Studio audience, have you guys heard anything about this, Matt? Oh, yeah, blow off for too long. Yeah, Matt yeah. says you could lose head retention if you get have too much foam blown off. Yeah, there's. Uh, heard that about blowovers too. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a whole lot. There's wife's tales out there with brewing. 
And that's basically what it's all about. Hot yeah, hot side aeration. There's the old uh, hot side aeration. There it is. <laughs> that's basically the keyword for that. It's kind of the UFO of brewing. If you really know what a hot side aeration is, then you'd understand that. But if not, <laughs> don't worry about don't it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Well, if not, or if you do know and you want to know more about it, uh, we'll have you go get the sky hook, and uh, you can go ahead and get that sky hook and and hook up the crane. And we can all go snipe hunting. We can go snipe yeah. hunting. It'll be it'll be, it'll be a lot of laughs. And you can go get that rebar stretcher from the trailer. So what did we learn tonight? Well, we learned that uh, the quizzes from uh, the half ass sports are cast always are, fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and they're always wrong, just like me. Right. And the uh, we learned that Fort Washita Fort Washita burned, but they're trying to rebuild it. They're so going to rebuild it. They're going on. to. Yeah, they're they're going to. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. happen. So come out and help us raise some money. Talked about blue bonnet. Blue bonnet. Learned how much fun it is to judge other people's beer because it's not your beer. And we're gonna find out in a little while how how fun it is to get judged. Ooh, not so fun. Not so fun. Actually, I'm kind of looking forward. <laughs> yeah, to it'll it. be fun. Yeah. And uh, for those of you out there. Uh, who want to stick around and watch this, we're going to uh, follow this up immediately. We will podcast this as well, but, uh, you know, it's more fun to watch it live. Absolutely. So thank you very much for joining us, and we'd like you to always remember that we are not professionals. So please try this at home. Frustration, the memorization of the things I'm gonna do to you. This so I, I just want the internet, by the way. I uh, give it the big you to make awesome bags out of them. Have you seen those? Yeah. Yeah.